evening. I am uh, Marie-Laure Salle. I'm the director of the Geneva Graduate Institute. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a real pleasure to welcome you uh, this evening on, online. I think that a lot of people are online, but also here at the Maison de la Paix on behalf of the entire Geneva Graduate Institute community. We are delighted to be a co-host and co-organizer together with you and Geneva and Akins of the 2022 annual meeting. I understand that you've had already two very rewarding, very rich days of discussion. So my words of welcome are a bit uh, coming a bit late, but they are very sincere nevertheless. Let me start by extending a number of thanks. First, a big thank you to Ms. Lise Grande for having accepted to deliver the keynote this year. And I'm very much looking forward Lise, to listening to you. I would also like to express our deep gratitude to the sponsors of this event, in particular to the UN Division of the Swiss uh, Federal Division of Foreign Affairs and to the Republican Canton of Geneva, Geneva. A warm thank you also to our other sponsors and donors. Naturally, I would like to underscore the amazing work that has been done by the three program chairs, Franz Baumann from New York University, Mary McCulloch from uh, IOM, and our own Cecilia Cannon from the Institute. Thank you also to the Akins annual meeting managers. And uh, at the Institute, I also want naturally to give a big thank you as always to our teams for their very professional and effective management of the complexities of these types of big events. And I'm listing here Kim Venman, Lena Menge, Melissa Iglesias Vallat, Dan Granham, and the entire events and communication teams of the Institute. We are all excited to be holding this hybrid event and to have uh, many of you here in presence, with more than 350 people attending in person uh, across the three days and an additional 250 following virtually from around the world. The Geneva Graduate Institute has a very long-standing institutional uh, membership uh, at, with the ACUNS and many of our faculty and graduate students have been long-standing ACUNS member and attended uh, ACUNS workshop and conferences in the past. And I cannot not mention actually Tom, who I saw here was being a key <laughs> connection uh, with ACUNS. Uh, for the Institute, this is an important collaboration. We have a lot in common. We share the mission of bridging research and policy with a view to better understand and better address today's global challenges, and indeed there are many. We share also a conviction that excellent academic research with a strong interdisciplinary orientation is absolutely necessary to make sense of those global challenges and of the, of the contemporary transnational con governance dynamics. And we also share the project to use this academic research with a view to deploy evidence-based solution, which happens to be the title of um, this year's um, uh, conference, in a manner that is as pragmatic and effective as possible as the urgency around global challenges is intensifying every day. And as when you listen to the news, including the very latest news that some of you may have seen, we feel that we're going backwards really fast and way too fast. There's probably no better place than Geneva for research policy collaborations and the participation of many policy actors at this year's conference is indicative of this. Uh, and I'm not going to give the list of all uh, international organizations that have a seat in Geneva, you know that as, uh, as well as I do, but many of them are being represented here uh, today. I've been told uh, that we are experimenting this year in helping Akins launch some innovative features. Um, I'm encouraging you therefore to go and check the demo room where research policy tools are on display and where policy actors can demonstrate how they work. This is taking place in room S9. If you're lost, ask any of us, we'll uh, show you the way. And we are also exploring there apparently a new post-COVID style of academic publication sponsorship. We saw it on, on, the, on the screen a bit before with QR code posters of relevant um, books that each one of, uh, each one, uh, can, of us can browse on exhibition in the demo room. So I'm myself actually very much looking forward to checking this out as I'm not exactly sure yet how it works, but I will understand hopefully after I go there. It's now time to turn to the John Holmes Memorial Lecture. And as I said, I'm very much looking forward to that. And I will actually leave Liz, uh, Liz Award, present Liz 
the grande. So the two leases are going to find a way to take the next step. <laughs> Thank you very much and have a great evening. Thank you so much, Marie-Laure uh, um, the, the director of, of, of this amazing institute. It's just such a pleasure to be here. I cannot tell you how grateful we are um, that you're hosting us here today, along with you and Geneva. It has been an amazing, well, opening session yesterday at UN Geneva, and then today has just, I've, I've gotten so much good feedback. And the thing that I don't know is whether, um, I'm, I'm having so much positive feedback because people are afraid to tell me what's going wrong or, or if, um, um, but, it, but knowing that we're academics, I think that generally we're kind of squeaky wheel type people and I would hear about it if things were not going very well. <laughs> um, but, oh, actually we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of diplomats also. So maybe that's 10, um, anyway. Um, we have had a, a couple of issues, but I want to thank, I want to add a couple of words of thanks. Um, also to our sponsors, the Republic of, and Canton of Geneva, Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, the Geneva Science Policy Interface, UN Academic Impact, Brill Press, Getty Press, the International Studies Association, the Global Governance Innovation Network. Thank you so much to all of our sponsors, to our co-chairs who, Marie, um, who, um, we just heard from Marita just mentioned them, Cecilia Cannon of PolySync and the Graduate Institute, Marie McAuliffe of the IOM and Franz Baumann of, of New York University. Thank you so much for the work you put into this. It is absolutely incredible. Um, if you'll indulge me for a moment, we have, we have three um, people who have been not sleeping very much for the last few days. Um, Filip Savatic, Anna Maria Andreska, and Naval Mulamerovic, thank you so much for everything you're doing. And Philip can't even enjoy his applause because he's... <laughs> um, and we have 10 students who I'm going to name, and I'm going to take the time to name them because they have been keeping us moving the whole time. Manoswini Sakar, Maria... Um, Kamenias, Yunshi Liang, Samuel Bo, Li Zhang, Medea uh, Segan, Segantini, uh, Chatrina Schumacher, India Belgrabi, Arvin Sodi, Manuel Leon, Maria Jankara, and Jamila Bahe. Thank you so, so much for making sure all of our rooms function and that everything is happening. And if I've forgotten everyone, if I've forgotten anyone, please, please accept my sincere thanks. We just, we are so appreciative of everybody who makes this possible. Okay. So a word about Aikens and not too many words, because I think I said too many words this morning when, um, um, when President Turk was, was presenting earlier. Um, uh, a couple of words. We've been around for 35 years. We've gone through a big transition over the last two years. We're now an incorporated nonprofit. We're relaunching into, new, into a new space. There are all kinds of new things that we're doing. And, and this is among them, is these new the partnerships in, during the annual meeting. So for 35 years, the ACONS has been having this annual meeting. And sometimes it's in partnership with the UN. And we want to make sure to build on this foundation of, of pairing the UN, pairing the annual meeting with the UN partner. Um, uh, I'm not going to say more about ACONS, actually. I, 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 I have a lot to say about ACONS in general. And if you would like to talk about ACONS, come talk to me about it. Um, I, I am the president of ACONS. I probably should have said that somewhere along the way. Um, and it is um, uh, Charlotte Koo and I have been working on, on making sure Akon stays together along with Philip Savitich over the last couple of years. It is the labor of love um, that we're so happy to share with all of you. Um, I want to talk now about the John's home, John Holmes Memorial Lecture. So this lecture series began in 1989 in order of Aiken's founding member, John Holmes. Um, he was a lifetime Canadian diplomat and a scholar of the UN. He was one of the organizers of the founding conference of Aiken's in 1987. 
Every year, the John's Ho John Holmes Memorial Lecture is presented at the Aikens Annual Meeting by a renowned scholar or practitioner of the UN and of international affairs. And I can't think of anyone better than Lise Grande to, pre to present this lecture. Um, Lise Grande is the president and CEO of the US Institute of Peace, which is an independent, nonpartisan, federally, fund federally funded institute charged with the mission to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict around the world. She has 25 years of continuous overseas experience leading, managing, and coordinating complex operations for the United Nations. Grande has held leadership positions in humanitarian stabilization, peacekeeping, peace building, and development operations in lots of different countries. I'm just going to name some of them on many different continents, right? So she played key leadership roles in South Sudan, DR Congo, and Iraq, this, the hardest, most complicated places you can imagine. She was the leader <laughs> in, in top leadership roles. In UNDP, she was the uh, resident coordinator in India, and she had two hats actually, in Yemen of all places. Um, she is one of the most extraordinary leaders the UN has today. Um, she's been breaking barriers for women at the highest levels of the UN, serving in the most dangerous posts. She is a pioneer, a pathbreaker, and a tremendous inspiration. And I'm so happy to welcome you here today. Thank you so much for coming. I'm very pleased to be here and I consider it an honor to have been asked to deliver this year's John Holmes Memorial Lecture. When I looked at the title, um, it reminded me of one of the training programs you go through when the UN decides that you're under consideration to become a resident coordinator. Resident coordinator is the position in the UN that is responsible for trying to facilitate and coordinate the actions of all of the UN agencies that are working in a country that isn't under a Security Council mandate. So as part of this training, this is what happens to you. You are handed a file and you are told that you must deliver a speech at an international gathering of ministers of agriculture. And the speech is on plant breeding. <laughs> when you actually walk up to the podium and you open the file, your speech is on breast feeding. <laughs> and so what the examiners are doing is looking at how you cope with this dissonance. So when I looked at the title and then I looked at the speech that I'm about to give, I suddenly realized that we have um, dissonance because what, with your permission, I am gonna be talking about is the um, really extraordinary record within the United Nations on civilian protection. That is a key part of the global peace architecture, but not as broadly writ as suggested by the title. During the many years that I served in the UN, I came like so many others to regard the United Nations as one of our century's most remarkable institutions. Its contributions since 1945 include a range of functions that can only be achieved effectively through multilateral action, including, but not limited to, facilitating relations between great powers, and providing mechanisms that help to channel and accommodate the expectations of emerging and regional powers. The UN Security Council, the UN General Assembly, and the UN Agency Funds and Programs have helped to stabilize fragile and failing states. UN organs are currently instrumental in forging common approaches to climate change and environmental shock. Humanitarian agencies in partnership with countless non-governmental organizations have and are continuing to provide life-saving assistance to people who have nowhere else to go and no one else to turn to. Committed to goals set by the United Nations, countries are lifting billions of people out of poverty and establishing mechanisms to share wealth and resources more equitably and larger freedom by any measure 
These are impressive achievements. Some are arguably unprecedented. Of its many contributions over the past 75 years, I would like to single out for reflection this evening the concept and practice of protecting civilians during war and conflict. There are two reasons why. First, protection of civilians, although an important but subsidiary issue for global leaders at the birth of the UN, is now a cornerstone of international relations and therefore deserving of special attention. Second, because of the UN, protection has become a threshold of civilized behavior for belligerents and states everywhere and is a concrete expression of the moral commitments that lay at the heart of the UN Charter. Many of the norms that have been established through the UN these past 75 years may not survive the challenges the world now collectively faces, but it is the fervent hope of countless people across the planet that civilian protection remains a central pillar and not a casualty of the new unstable age we are entering. It's been breathtaking to see the evolution of protection from being a concept to becoming widely held doctrine and a body of practice implemented in conflicts across the globe. This journey from idea to reality has been possible because of the UN's unique structure and role. Those of us who are very close to this issue will tell you in all honesty and conviction, civilian protection could not have become widespread doctrine, nor could it have become a reality in practice were the UN not here. In terms of doctrine, we've seen civilian protection evolve from being a foundational principle of international humanitarian law to being the justification for authorizing the use of multinational force to intervene in and infringe on the sovereignty of a country that is unable or unwilling to protect the civilians in its territory. There are very few doctrines, concepts, or practices that authorize an infringement on an intervention in a country's sovereignty. Civilian protection is one of them. In the case of practice, we've seen civilian protection evolve from being a subset of activities that is done in some countries and some conflicts to being a central pillar of international engagement and an integral component of military campaigns in many conflicts. The change is particularly striking in doctrine. NATO countries and almost all UN and African Union peacekeeping missions now follow military doctrines that include civilian protection, either as a set of obligations on soldiers or more expansively as lines of effort that are population centric. We can see a similar trajectory in practice with civilian protection evolving from distributions of life-saving assistance to the development of military strategies that elevate protection as a central aim of war and battle plans. I'd like to reflect on these changes in two ways. First, by surveying very briefly key milestones in the history of civilian protection, and second, by looking at concrete case studies of practice of civilian protection in the field. As of course many of us are aware, protection of civilians in both practice and doctrine derives from three historically recent bodies of law, international humanitarian law, which started to be codified at the end of the 19th century, and international human rights law and international refugee law, both of which took shape in response to the cataclysmic events of World War II together. These three bodies of law set norms for the treatment of civilians during armed conflict 
and constitute one of the most accepted thresholds for civilized behavior by states and nations. The norms are based on the principle that people who take up arms must do so in a way that limits harm to civilians. The first major attempt to create binding constraints on the behavior of belligerents towards civilians occurred during the First World War when the International Committee of the Red Cross and Crescent, then League of Nations, worked to establish protocols for the treatment of civilians in territories controlled and occupied by belligerents. Allow me to correct that. It was after the First World War when that effort was made. Although these efforts did help to expand existing definitions and ideas of protection, ratification of actual protocols proved impossible during the dark, unstable years between the two wars. At the end of the Second World War, however, there was a very different dynamic. Six years of global conflict had resulted in between 70 and 85 million deaths. 50 million of these were not soldiers. They were civilians, including at least 6 million people who died in the Holocaust and tens of million who were the victims of starvation, disease, and massacre. Shocked and sickened by the impact of the Second World War, coming less than 20 years after the First World War, the Allied powers decided at the height of fighting in 1943 that the only way to prevent future war from engulfing the world was to establish an international security organization responsible for policing unstable areas, promoting international understanding, and preventing aggression. One month after Germany surrendered in Europe, the victorious powers, 50 countries aided by jurists, humanitarians, and activists established, as we know, the most ambitious and far-reaching collective security framework in modern times. The United Nations was based on two truly remarkable conventions, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and on the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment for the Crime of Genocide, both of which enshrined the right of all people to life and dignity, even in conditions of war and conflict. Despite these doctrinal foundations, early UN peacekeeping missions did not focus on protecting civilians. They focused on the monitoring of ceasefires and the disengagement of belligerents. It wasn't until 1960 when the UN Security Council extended the scope of peacekeeping, moved itself closer to the spirit of the charter, and took the step of authorizing a multinational force to maintain order in Congo and to protect civilian life in the newly independent country. Although a major milestone in civilian protection, there were no other similar peacekeeping missions during the entire Cold War. So the UN does nothing after the charter is created. Once during the Cold War, it tries to protect civilians and then doesn't do anything in this realm until the end of the Cold War. But when that Cold War ended, there was a major shift. Starting in 1991, when the UN Security Council explicitly recognized the threat to international peace and security caused by humanitarian crises, UN efforts to protect civilians have expanded exponentially. Since 1999, the UN Security Council has authorized more than 15 peacekeeping missions with mandates, Security Council mandates to protect civilians. This includes what are known as the four big missions, Central African Republic, Mali, again, the Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan. Of the close to 70,000 UN blue helmets, blue berets and staff who now serve in peacekeeping missions across the world, 80% of these 70,000 people are involved in protection. The doctrinal basis for authorizing international interventions to protect civilians evolved again and very significantly at the start of the 21st century, when global leaders adopted the principle 
of the responsibility to protect, known as R2P, at the 2005 UN World Summit. This principle, which took shape following the genocide in Rwanda and the terrible mass violence in the former Yugoslavia, holds that when sovereign states can't or won't protect their citizens and the people living within the territories they control, the UN Security Council is justified in taking collective action in that country to protect civilians. It infringes on sovereignty. In 2011, the Security Council invoked the R2P principle when it authorized intervention in Libya. As of course, many of us know, the Libyan mission is now widely seen as having failed to prevent state collapse and chaos. And this has raised the uncomfortable question about whether the Security Council will be willing in the near future to again invoke R2P as a basis for a peacekeeping operation. At the same time that peacekeeping has become increasingly focused on civilian protection, so too has global humanitarian action. Starting also at the end of the Cold War, humanitarian organizations have expanded their reach and deepened their impact to the point where in nearly every armed conflict in the past 30 years, humanitarians have either been on the line of contact near front lines or with displaced populations providing assistance and where they can protection. The range of humanitarian engagement is incredible. Humanitarians negotiate access frameworks, no strike zones, days of tranquility, and humanitarian ceasefires with both state and non-state belligerents. They demine the roads used to deliver aid, keep open the routes used by civilians to access farms, schools, hospitals, and water sources, and they provide an extensive range of assistance, good, and services to people who need this help to survive. The overwhelming majority of direct international engagement with belligerents during armed conflict is now done by unarmed humanitarians who have more day-to-day -day contact with fighters and military and political leaders than any of the special envoys or mediators dispatched to help end conflicts. When I started working with the UN in the mid-1990s, humanitarian negotiation and diplomacy were relatively new. The picture is now very different. Nearly every humanitarian organization has specialized staff trained in negotiation. And there are now entire units in milling militaries which work with belligerent forces and humanitarian agencies to deconflict convoys, establish corridors, operationalize no strike lists, and oversee and manage days of tranquility and humanitarian ceasefires. With so much more capacity now invested in humanitarian diplomacy, the pace of what can be done to protect civilians has accelerated dramatically. When I was a junior officer in Sudan during the 1996 famine and in Angola during the last days of the civil war between the MPLA and UNITA, it took weeks, sometimes months, to deconflict a single aid convoy. Ten years later, when I was reposted to South Sudan, as many as 50 convoys per week were being deconflicted during the dry season. One per month to 50 per week. In the seven armed conflicts, I worked on the line of contact during the 90s and early knots. Most snow strike lists were limited to a handful of major hospitals, schools, and sometimes historic cultural sites. In my last UN assignment as the head of UN operations in Yemen, the no strike list covered 22,000 separate schools, 22,000 separate locations, including all forms of civilian infrastructure, 
from schools to hospitals to irrigation systems, asphalt plants, dairy farms, and sewage plants. During the past 30 years, we've also seen a steady progression in the sophistication and range of frontline protection practice. I'll use the example of South Sudan to show what I mean. In 1987, Cold War wasn't over yet, the UN negotiated one of the first comprehensive humanitarian access frameworks involving a state belligerent, the government of Sudan, and a non-state belligerent, the SPLM, Sudan People's Liberation Movement. This was known as Operation Lifeline Sudan. The framework was based on the principles of mutual transparency and mutual obligation. Before a neutral party, the UN or a non-governmental organization could deliver any form of assistance, both the government and the SPLM had to agree on the type of aid that was going to be delivered and the location where it would be delivered. Each side could choose to veto or prohibit deliveries on the other side. But if they did so, a similar veto was expected by the other belligerent. This mutual humanitarian deterrence balanced the actions of both belligerents. Protection was further advanced in South Sudan in 1995 when the UN and SPLM negotiated a separate agreement known as the ground rules. This followed a series of violations by the non-state belligerent, the SPLM. This addendum to the original OLS framework spelled out the conditions for the delivery of assistance in the areas that the SPLM controlled. The UN and humanitarian diplomats used it as a mechanism for obligating a non-state armed group to the principles of the Geneva Courts. A third milestone occurred three years later, 1998, when the UN established the Technical Committee for Humanitarian Assistance. This was a very, very interesting body. The TCHA brought the Sudan government together with the SBLM. They would agree on mechanisms for how to deliver assistance. This very discreet face-to-face -face humanitarian forum, however, became one of the platforms that was used by the two parties to build trust, to address their grievances, and very importantly, to discuss the scenarios for ending the conflict. Finally, as we all know, in 2005, after 40 years of intermittent war, the two parties signed a comprehensive peace agreement laying the groundwork for the separation of South Sudan into an independent state. On the day South Sudan became independent, efforts to protect civilians advanced even further when the UN Security Council established a new UN peacekeeping mission and authorized it to use all necessary means, that would include lethal action, within its capacity and areas of deployment to assist the new government of South Sudan to protect civilians. Unfortunately, almost as soon as the new country was born, civil war within South Sudan erupted. Operating under one of the strongest civilian protection mandates ever issued by the Security Council, the UN peacekeeping mission, which continues to this day, has played a significant protection role, evacuating civilians from war zones, interposing its troops between belligerent forces, and establishing protected perimeters for civilians inside of UN compounds. What we see in South Sudan, and again, only possible under the UN, is a steady progression of protection practice from a negotiated framework of principles to binding rules of humanitarian engagement, to dispute and confidence building measures, and then to the use of multinational force to protect civilians in a sovereign country. The second case I'd like to study, or case study I'd like to share, focuses on the way that battle plans and military campaigns themselves are being shaped by the principles of civilian protection. Possibly the best, most recent example of this is the year long battle to retake the city of Mosul in Iraq. Everyone who was part of the US-led coalition and campaign to degrade and defeat ISIS knew that the battle to retake Mosul 
would be the hardest and the most difficult of the war. Two million civilians lived in Mosul. It was a city that straddled both sides of the Tigris River. ISIS was known to be present throughout the city, including in the densely packed, nearly impenetrable old city. Mosul Dam, one of the largest in the Middle East, and situated on an elevated plateau just north of the city, was controlled and could be blown up at any time by ISIS. Early planning scenarios for the Battle of Mosul that were done by the coalition and the Iraqi army were grim. All of the planners warned that the potential death toll would almost certainly top 100,000, if not higher. Experts predicted massive, uncontrolled displacement and warned of long delays in accessing civilians as they struggled to reach safety miles behind the front lines. Mass casualties were expected, and it was assumed that the triage and emergency trauma care would only be available many miles and hours from ports of contact and lines of control. Planning for Mosul started a year before the battle. And from the start, it focused on civilian protection. This was a decision that was taken by the Iraqi army. During discussions with the head of the Iraqi army, it was agreed that two specialized civil military staff from the United Nations would work with the Iraqi military's planning team in J-5. They'd be embedded right inside, providing guidance on how to protect civilians, including battle intent and defensive and offensive strategies. The UN specialized staff were also invited to work with the Iraqi Army Operations Team in J3 on mechanisms to sync military and civilian efforts, including guidance on direct tasking orders for Iraqi units. The battle plan had the following elements. Before entering a neighborhood, the Iraqi army would inform civilians that an operation would be starting. This was done by blanket leafleting, but also through community and religious networks that were inside the city. Civilians were told through these networks to shelter in their homes where Iraqi units would try to protect them and humanitarian organizations would try to reach them with aid. If Iraqi units were unable to establish sufficient area domination, efforts immediately shifted to a managed evacuation. As a first step in the evacuation process, civilians mustered and were escorted by the Iraqi military across lines of contact to safety. As soon as people crossed the contact line, humanitarians were right there providing first tier assistance. This included water, basic necessities, medical aid, family reunification and support for vulnerable people, including at-risk women, unaccompanied children, the elderly and physically challenged. Iraqi units were nearby, although not co-located to disarm civilians before they were boarded onto transport to take them to a registration center where they were either assigned to a camp or if they chose united with family and friends. As soon as families entered a camp, they were registered, assigned a tent, and given ration cards and a household kit. Within the first 48 hours, children were assigned to a school and family members received an arrival and protection visit, advising them on facilities and services within the camp and options if they wanted to leave. The Mosul operation also included a 24-hour secure alert and reporting mechanism. It linked the head of UN humanitarian operations to a special military police and oversight unit that reported to the head of the Iraqi army. This mechanism allowed humanitarians to report suspected violations of human rights committed by Iraqi personnel. Although I was not privy to all aspects of the unit's work, we know of at least four Iraqi units that were stood down and disciplined following activation of the channel. The channel was also used in situations where civilians were at immediate risk, either inside Mosul 
or on this side of the line of contact. It was activated more than 100 times for this purpose. Another feature of the Mosul operation was the trauma referral pathway, which was established by the World Health Organization. As many of you know, people who suffer a traumatic injury need help within an hour being injured in order to survive. If you're not reached within an hour, there's a 90% chance you will die. In most battle zones, it's nearly impossible to provide this. In the case of Mosul, humanitarian established trauma stabilization points. They were called TSPs. They were located on the line of contact. They were staffed by trauma specialists. When the line of contact moved, the TSPs packed up and moved with them. Injured were brought to the TSP either by white flagged medical personnel or the military. On average, it took trauma staff 15 to 30 minutes to stabilize a patient. Patients were then transported by ambulance to a level three mobile hospital, which was located within just a few kilometers of the line where advanced surgery and care was available. Once patients were ready to be moved from the level three, it was usually within just a few days, they were transferred to a tertiary hospital for longer term care. Those of you who are familiar with humanitarian action will appreciate that almost all level three care as the second tier is situated about 30 kilometers from a front line. These level three mobile hospitals were located within five kilometers of the line. During the year-long battle for Mosul, more than one million civilians safely sheltered in place. Another million were evacuated. On some days, as many as 10,000 civilians were escorted across lines of contact. Humanitarian agencies built and expanded 19 camps surrounding the city of Mosul. Construction of new tents and facilities continued nonstop up until the very last day of the battle. Nearly every family, 99.9% .9 of all the families who were evacuated from Mosul had a place to sleep in one of these camps on the day they crossed the front line. On some days it was pretty tight. I remember a very long week when we were literally down to one last open bed. More than 26,000 people with traumatic injury, the overwhelming majority of whom would have died were treated through the trauma pathway and survived. This included fighters with ISIL. As of course, everyone knows under international humanitarian law, if you're wounded, you immediately become civilian status. Of the 26,000 people who had traumatic injury, the majority were ISIL. Nearly every part of the Iraqi military and tens of humanitarian organizations played a role in what was, at the time, the largest managed evacuation of civilians from a war zone since World War II. Were there problems with the operation? You bet there were. Humanitarian organizations and Iraqi security forces had very different interpretations of humanitarian principles. There were innumerable difficulties with coordination between the military and humanitarians. Towards the end of the campaign, non-military security forces were drafted into Mosul. These forces had not been trained on the protection battle plan and didn't have sufficient capabilities to implement it fully. This led to mass destruction in the areas where they were operating and an increase in civilian fatalities. There were also concerns, very serious ones, that the participation of humanitarians in a managed evacuation with military forces was instrumentalizing humanitarian action. These were salient issues then and they are salient issues now. We have only to look at Ukraine to realize that there will almost certainly be many more situations in the months and years ahead where millions of civilian lives will be at stake in a kinetic theater of war. If I had given these remarks a year ago, 
I would almost certainly be ending them with a sense of anticipation about how much further civilian protection can be advanced, given the positive accelerating momentum in both doctrine and practice, which has occurred since the 2005 Global Summit. We are now in a very different place than we expected to be, with pressing urgent questions being asked about the viability of the existing rules-based international order, an order which has brought predictability to international relations during the past 75 years and created the conditions and institutions which have allowed civilian protection to evolve into being a foundational pillar of multinational engagement. It's not clear what will happen to the international order. It may rebound with renewed affirmations of its principles. Perhaps it will evolve into a fragmented order with more modest rules where countries concentrate on pragmatism and functional practical cooperation. Another possibility, many experts think this is where we'll probably end up, is that spheres of influence will emerge and consolidate managed by major and regional powers. Under that scenario, we could expect that some countries will insist on their neutrality and ask that great powers respect that neutrality. Under the scenario, we could almost certainly see other less fortunate states who are forced to exist in gray zones where their people are at constant risk by the predatory behavior of their neighbors, whatever happens. We know that humanitarian principles and civilian protection have set an unprecedented threshold for civilized behavior of states and nations for nearly a century now. It's the conviction of many of us that it is worth doing everything possible to ensure that these norms and these practices continue to be the basis for international engagement in the new age we're entering. I'd like to express my gratitude to the Academic Council on the United Nations system, most particularly to the exceptional Dr. Lise Howard, who I'm delighted to confirm is joining USIP this next year as our senior expert scholar in residence. Thank you for the invitation. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much. I'm going to let you settle. And um, so we're going to have a little bit of a discussion right now. Um, 